mentioned, uh, my talk is going to be about um, using Presto with streaming data. Um, so just a bit of background about me. Uh, I'm the uh, CTO and co-founder of Upsolver. Upsolver is a streaming uh, data lake platform, um, uh, very integrated with Presto because we're obviously populating the data that Presto is going to be querying on later. Uh, I used to be the CTO of uh, the largest data science department in the IDF uh, before working at Upsolver. And uh, uh, basically my entire professional career has been around uh, data, data science, uh, distributed systems, uh, things like that. Um, so I've pretty much seen data from all directions, be it like the producer, the consumer, uh, building machine learning models, et cetera. Um, so just a very quick, and I'm gonna do exactly 10 seconds on this slide. Um, just to give you kind of a uh, background on what Upsolver is. So Upsolver is basically, as I was saying, a data lake platform dealing with streaming data. So if you look at our architecture, uh, you have streaming data coming in uh, on the left. It would often be coming from a system like Kafka, Kinesis, possibly files landing on S3 or things like that. And then finally streaming out to systems like Presto, Athena, or uh, more traditional data warehouses like Snowflake or Redshift or Elasticsearch. Um, and many, many more on the left and on the right. Uh, this isn't an exhaustive uh, list. And then in the middle, you basically have an ETL platform. So something that takes the data, populates the data lake, builds it out, manages the storage layer for you and manages the metadata layer for you as well. And um, I'm really only touching on this for a second here to, to uh, uh, point out that having, uh, and we're gonna see later on in the uh, future slides, that having all of this centralized together and, and running in tandem is very, very important. Um, so I'm gonna jump right into the uh, streaming data um, uh, processing. So um, first of all, and I don't have a slide for this, um, let me talk a bit about what we're trying to accomplish here. Like what's, what's the goal uh, working with streaming data? So Presto is kind of like a rock star dealing with giant amounts of data. Um, you can store data super cheaply on S3, uh, run Presto either using Athena or run Presto in your own cluster uh, using a bunch of different uh, uh, systems um, and query data really easily, really quickly uh, and scanning huge volumes. Um, and that's really good for batch data because you kind of need to figure out how you're gonna be storing the data. Um, so, so if you just put a bunch of parquet files there and they're big enough, um, you can pretty much scale to whatever size you want and that's gonna work great. Um, the challenge comes when you want to deal with data that's more live. So, um, and this is very uh, common for large data sets in general. Where do large data sets come from is usually some system that's emitting events. So you have lots of events coming in all the time. And, and sure, we can have a one day delay in data processing. So I'm gonna have a bunch of files that are created every day. I'll organize everything and, and that's kind of my view. Um, but that really relegates Presto to a secondary role. Um, rather than being able to see data that's up to date now, um, I can only use Presto for kind of like the historic uh, um, long-term analytics. Um, and it leaves out a lot of value that I could get with data that's kind of fresh and, and, and as it's being generated. And then often what you're gonna see is a hybrid solution where you have Presto doing the long-term queries, whereas you have some other database system doing short-term queries. And having that separation really sucks because first of all, you have to maintain two systems and the database is generally gonna be very expensive as well. Um, but more than that, you don't even have all the data in one place. So if you wanna do a query that's spanning a lot of time back, but also looks at data from now, you're kind of stuck. So all that saying is that dealing with streaming data is often gonna be very valuable to organizations and as close as we can get to real time with the data, uh, the better insights we're going to get, the faster turnaround time to uh, to analytics, to uh, to action. So, so this is generally something that a lot of people are looking at, um, but it's really hard. And uh, the next uh, bunch of slides are going to be talking about why it's so hard um, and what we're doing at Upsolver to uh, to mitigate this. Because, as I was saying in the beginning, uh, Upsolver is a unified solution, so we take care of all of the interactions that need to be done in order for streaming data processing to work properly. Um, so I'm going to start with orchestration. Um, if we're dealing with batch data, you have to run a task once a day. Uh, in the end, that's not that hard. We have tools like Airflow. Um, they're good at managing that kind of process. They're resilient in the face of errors and things like that. Um, and also, even if a job fails, I can always notify an engineer. They'll take a look, rerun the job, and all's well. 
um, when we're talking about stream processing, it's a lot harder. Um, not only do I have to have everything completely automated because an engineer isn't going to be able to pop in in a timely manner and, and fix that, um, but also there are a lot of uh, interactions of the data between uh, within itself that become very difficult to manage. So um, all sorts of things like timing and uh, what data window I want to look at and if I'm doing any kind of partitioning or things like that, um, these things become very tricky because data is constantly coming in and I have to decide when am I cutting off. And that cutoff point can, uh, if it's not consistent, it can either lead to data loss or, or data duplication, uh, which we're going to touch on later on. Um, so basically, I need some way to, to, to look at all this data in a, in a consolidated way and saying like, um, whereas in a normal batch process, all the data up until a certain point in time, that data is going to stream in um, uh, when the batch process runs. In a streaming sense, there isn't a very clear boundary. And I have to kind of figure that out as I'm doing my joins, as I'm doing my aggregations, et cetera. And I'm just going to quickly show you what that looks like um, as a query in Upsolver. And um, really, there isn't, uh, we're not going to like look at this query too much. I just wanted to point out um, um, three, three main parts. Um, so this is just uh, Upsolver in the end is a UI platform that also uses SQL as an underlying language. So you can switch between the UI and the SQL. Um, and if I'm looking at the SQL statement, a few things are going to stand out. First of all, that we're doing a join between two streams. Um, in this case, this stream is actually uh, a group by on top of the same stream, but that's uh, uh, um, uh, out of scope. Um, but the two things that are very interesting are, first of all, this window clause, which is not ANSI SQL, and kind of tells the system or tells the ETL process, I want to look at 90 days when doing this aggregation. So I want to uh, uh, look at a, at a certain window, at a certain range of time where data came in. Um, and that's very, very important when I'm doing a streaming join because, um, because as data collects, as data comes in, I want to be able to be very accurate in, in how much data back I'm going to be looking at. And same thing for synchronization between streams. So notice the second keyword after five minutes, which is telling me that the main stream, I actually wanted to wait around for, for five minutes until enough data collects on the, on the other side. And that's very important when I have, for example, two events that happen staggered. And so when I'm joining between them, I'm going to have to wait for the second event to happen before I can actually pull it in and populate. Um, now, this kind of thing is very, very hard to orchestrate manually because it's happening uh, constantly. It's running in a, uh, all the time. Um, so just being able to, to grab a snapshot in time is, is quite challenging if I don't have the tools to do that. Um, all right. So, so that's a bit about just orchestration. Um, now I'm going to touch on uh, file management, which is a lot closer. I mean, the orchestration part is really general to all streaming systems. There's nothing special uh, related to Presto. File management is a lot more important to Presto itself. Um, the reason is, is that if I'm pushing streaming data into a database, which is generally what the solution is going to be uh, 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 up until now for that kind of system, um, the database takes care of all of the consolidation and optimizations and stuff like that. Uh, at most, I'm going to have to run some kind of vacuum or, or, or gather statistics or something uh, along those lines. But generally, it's going to take care of it. Whereas if I'm expecting to use Presto as the query layer and I want to just have Parquet files on S3 to have cheap storage, um, I need to decide which files I'm going to be creating. And this actually becomes uh, uh, quite complicated when you're talking about streaming data for a bunch of reasons. Um, I mean, obviously in batch, so I have once a day, I'm writing a file. And if I have five gigs of data every day, so maybe I'll write five files uh, each of one gig, uh, one gig each. Um, but if I have five gigs of data coming in, but I want a latency of one minute, so I want new data to be available to query um, as it's emitted or within a minute of it being emitted, I have to generate 1,440 files. Um, per day. So these files can't be a gig each. They'll be like a few megabytes each. And that means that as the day progresses, um, my partition becomes super, uh, it just has a lot of small files, which means query performance is going to be really bad. Um, not exactly what we wanted to achieve uh, when using Presto for this kind of use case. Um, that's just even in a simple scenario where my partitions 
aren't anything special. So I'm just looking at partitioning by, as new data comes in, I just want to push it into the same partition. Um, but let's say if, and here I'll again jump to show you a, uh, a SQL statement. Um, so if we look at this example, where we're again running on top of a resource utilization stream, but in this case, I want to partition by both the uh, date of the, uh, of the event, but also by the AWS region. So I have events coming in from all sorts of regions and my query pattern is gonna be uh, such that I'm only ever gonna look at a specific region at once. Um, so now partitioning by date and region. So, okay, all the new data is gonna go into the same date, but I'm constantly gonna be pushing data into each of the different regions. So my challenge is multiplied by the amount of regions that I'm working in. Whereas it used to be that I need to write one file every minute if I wanted a one minute latency. Now I'm gonna to need to write maybe 10 or 20 files each minute, um, which is gonna make uh, the problem of querying it uh, 20 times worth, worse, or at least the data management problem of having a lot of files uh, sitting around on S3. Um, so the solution to this problem is actually quite, quite simple. Uh, it's just writing small files, and then as they collect, we need to rewrite them as bigger files. Um, the problem is, is that we need to make sure that um, when a user is querying, they get a, a consistent view of the data. So on the one hand, they don't want to be running queries and then suddenly data disappears. And on the other hand, they don't want that uh, as a compaction occurs, uh, suddenly they have delays in the data. They still want to have, they don't care that this background process is running. They want to query and get, get results and that's it. Um, so that's something that um, that's generally very challenging to manage. And again, Upsolver uh, kind of manages that for you, uh, as you saw also with the um, with the queries that just define the partitions. Um, but file management is a very, very important part of getting good performance in general out of Presto. Um, it's just that it's more challenging with streaming data, but this is just as important when you're dealing with batch data. Um, and this is on top of, of course, doing best practices like file compression and using columnar formats and things like that, uh, partitioning your tables, of course. Um, another challenge, which is really not well addressed in general for Presto, um, and is kind of the point where often people are going to be going towards uh, uh, databases instead of data lakes. Um, Apache Hoodie is an example of, of uh, uh, open source that's kind of trying to tackle this solution, um, but in general is dealing with mutability. So data that can be, uh, can be modified. Um, a lot of data sets don't need to be modified. They're append only by nature. So if I have a, a, a log of, of website views, uh, when a view happens, it happened, and there isn't gonna be any update to that or any changes in that data. It's, it's a single point in time of event, uh, a point in time event, and then it, and then it finished. But sometimes uh, it's very important to update data in the past. Like for example, if I have a, um, a stream of orders and an order can uh, get new statuses or it can be deleted, uh, uh, refunded, et cetera. So there are a lot of things that can apply to that in retrospect, which I really don't want to then start looking around in all sorts of different files in order to consolidate that. Um, my, my analysts, they just wanna be able to see the one record for the order. Um, also, uh, GDPR and CCPA uh, contain rights to be forgotten. So often uh, larger companies are gonna get requests to delete records from the data lake. Um, and that can be extremely challenging when I just have a bunch of parquet files. Uh, I don't even know where the user's records are, um, let alone have necessarily the capability to, to rewrite the files uh, in a meaningful way without, uh, um, without doing a lot of processing or doing damage to the rest of the lake. Um, also, um, often, even if there isn't a, a, let's say, strong necessity to have mutable data, uh, being able to consolidate records. So for example, um, having a table where I want the aggregation of all the events of the last hour, just to count star, and, but I still don't want to give up on, my, uh, on the uh, speed of, uh, of update. So as the current hour is happening, I want the counter to continually increase until it finally stabilizes at the end of the hour. Um, that kind of use case is, is very powerful for reducing data cardinality, but again, requires updating the data set. So all these things are kind of talking to why I would want to do mutability, but how can I do that on a data lake? It's super uh, challenging. Um, so using a system like Hoodie uh, is one solution. Upsolver also has a built-in approach to, uh, uh, to handling mutable data. Um, but let's say this is the kind of thing that I would say, don't try this at home. 
So uh, running your own mutable data pipeline is going to be insanely difficult. Um, so I do strongly recommend using a tool uh, to manage it. Um, the way Upsolver does it is that we try to, uh, or we don't try, we actually succeed in, uh, in keeping the data mutable while it's still consistent uh, using views within Presto. So essentially we just add an additional partition. Uh, it's just vanilla parquet files. There isn't any kind of proprietary transaction log. We use a separate partition with parquet files uh, in order to manage that and continuously compact, which uh, as I was talking about in the previous slide, uh, dealing with file management and needing compaction. So we're using the exact same mechanism to compact the write ahead log as well uh, to make sure that that, that again uh, performs well. But just using views on top of fresh data that's being added to the write ahead log to make sure that there is a consistent view uh, of, the, of the data at all times uh, and representing the latest, um, the latest view. Um, if I uh, jump back into this uh, uh, aggregation query, so this is actually an example of an updating table. So uh, in this case, we have the replace on duplicate keyword um, as again, as an extension to the SQL. So basically what's happening here is that I'm saying, um, I want each host to have a single row. Uh, the aggregation is by host and by region and by partition date. Of course, a host is only gonna ever appear in one region. So that's not gonna create any kind of duplications. Um, uh, if there were, by the way, the system would jump the host between the partitions. So since the duplicate is only host, uh, a host will only appear in a single partition. And then I want some simple aggregations. So I wanna know when was the first time I saw the host, when was the last time, and uh, what's the average uh, CPU usage. So this is kind of how you would do this kind of updating table definition um, within Upsolver. And the nice thing here is that it's completely declarative. Uh, you don't need to get into the weeds of what files are gonna be created, how is it managing the partitions, how is it doing the compaction process behind the scenes. Uh, Upsolver's execution engine kind of takes care of all that for you. And this is again, getting back to um, when you're dealing with streaming data, especially, it's very important that the platform that you're using kind of needs to do everything for you uh, uh, in the sense of the file management. Because as soon as you have any kind of manual management, you really need to know a lot about what you need to do to make things work properly. Um, and, and that's like, uh, it's just a huge overhead that most organizations aren't gonna wanna take on. Um, all right, so, um, so lastly, I'm gonna talk a bit about stream processing and kind of what are the actual technical gotchas. So up until now, I've been talking about um, um, value to the users and kind of design paradigms, um, but what actually are the things that I need to watch out for when I'm designing a stream processing system? And again, all of this is kind of taken care for you within Upsolver, um, so you don't need to worry about it. But it's very important, especially if you are planning to deal with stream processing uh, on top of data in the lake, um, uh, to, to kind of think about these challenges. Uh, um, and I'd say that most of them come down to exactly once message processing. So um, if I know how to deal with each message exactly one time and give it a, a correct context for that message, so being able to pull in the right history or the right data from the future in order to enrich it, uh, I'm golden. Um, that of course isn't uh, really well uh, defined or easy thing to do or even necessarily a mathematically possible thing to do. Um, but essentially like when we talk about exactly once processing, we want to avoid duplicate events. So I want to make sure that if I have an event coming in from a stream, I don't process it twice and put it into two different files on S3. Um, I want to avoid missing events. So I don't want to accidentally skip it because the process crashed and started running on another, uh, on another server. Um, I want to be able to deal with events that arrive out of order, but also I want to make sure that the order of the events is maintained. So if I have an event uh, that happened uh, now, uh, but it actually was supposed to have happened three hours ago, and I just got it now because of some network outage, I want to process it in the right position of my stream. Um, and that's something that's kind of very hard to, to, to even understand what I'm trying to explain there, uh, uh, let alone uh, deal with that uh, uh, in code. And then finally, I wanna be able to deal with old data as well. So I don't wanna commit to a certain data pipeline. And then uh, if I have a bug in it, then, then I can only run data from now because old data has a lot of value. So I wanna be able to back process all that data. Um, and, and again, making sure that 
when I'm doing the back processing, I'm again dealing with the data only exactly once. So I need a back processing uh, system that's aware of the stream system and make sure that there isn't uh, uh, stuff going on in par parallel. Um, so there are a bunch of ways that systems tend to deal with this uh, general uh, exactly once processing paradigm. And the, uh, let's say, safest solution that kind of sidesteps the pro problem, and this is also what Upsolver does, is it uses idempotent operations. Um, to anyone who doesn't know, idempotent operations means that I'm going to write this uh, a file to one place and make sure that if I ever have to run it again, it's not going to change anything. Um, so, so the idempotent actually means that uh, I can reapply the same operation without changing the, the final state. Um, so basically, if I'm using a file system that guarantees that any operation I do writes a file and, and then that file can never be overwritten in a different way, and then operations just take files from one place and write, uh, write modified files to another, um, that kind of takes care of all of these different uh, uh, issues for me because everything has to be consistent in order for it to work. And it leans on guarantees of, the, uh, um, of blob storage in order to ensure that um, uh, basically the guarantee is that if a file is written, then it's going to be read uh, in the exact same way, regardless who is reading it and when. Um, so Upsolver really relies on this kind of idempotent operations on S3. And, and again, kind of um, illustrates how important it is for everything to be synchronized within one system. Because if I have someone else writing files, then, then I lose all my guarantees. You need to kind of, have a, kind of have one system that's reading the data from the source, be it Kafka, be it uh, uh, S3 or whatever it is, uh, doing all the different processing steps, and finally outputting it to Parquet files, which I'm querying from, uh, from Presto. Um, all right. Um, I'm jumping back again to the uh, architecture slide just to consolidate everything into one, one picture. So you have streaming data coming in, um, for example, being emitted from uh, into Kafka uh, uh, using uh, uh, from from some uh, um, system in the wild. You have the data lake platform, which pulls the data in from the source, stores it on S3, uh, makes sure that everything is optimized as as a usable data lake, runs the transformations, which are defined in SQL, uh, which can consolidate multiple sources together, uh, pushes that into Parquet files, which are then managed. Um, uh, as well as after being written the first time, they're also managed as part of a compaction process. Their metadata is, is managed in the Glue Data Catalog. Um, so I can always just go to a Presto cluster, run a query, and get results on the actual full data uh, without needing to worry about compactions and exactly once and, uh, and, uh, um, and mutable data and all sorts of things like that. All of that needs to be done uh, declaratively, either using SQL or using the UI. Um, so I hope that was informative. Um, the goal of this uh, uh, talk was, uh, um, oh, hold on. Uh, the goal of this talk was really to just illustrate the points, the difficulties of dealing with streaming data and a bit talk about why people actually want to use streaming data. And I really think that the more people who get streaming data into their data lakes, uh, the more powerful, let's say the more uh, uh, following Presto is gonna have because uh, the, the nearer to real time you are when you're querying your data, the more value the organization gets and the more exposure the system that's, that's actually providing that value is gonna get. So that's something I'm very excited about. Um, I'm gonna add just a little bit about what we as Upsolver are working on. Uh, so everything I talked about up until now is, uh, is GA. So that's uh, uh, Upsolver that you can buy off the shelf at the moment. Um, in the future, uh, in the near future. So we're working on extending uh, Presto, uh, essentially adding support for um, uh, mostly DMLs and specifically inserts, updates, and deletes. So adding update functionality entirely. Presto today doesn't have that syntax. Uh, so adding that into Presto. Uh, inserts and deletes from the data lake uh, in kind of a general way. So today you have uh, a very simple delete so you can run on Hive, but um, being able to interact with your data lake as you would with a database opens up a lot of uh, use cases which are very uh, uh, difficult today. Like for example, GDPR, being able to delete a specific user. Uh, what's easier than running a delete command on top of the lake and having something happen that just makes it work? Um, of course, that needs to be integrated with the storage layer in a very, very uh, tightly coupled way. Uh, but uh, using Upsolver uh, and then using 
presto in order to actually uh, do the interfacing and, and run the commands, uh, you're going to be able to get kind of a whole uh, uh, holistic solution to that. Uh, so that's something that we're very excited about. Um, of course, improving performance, that's something that's always going to be a huge uh, uh, challenge and desire. As performance gets better, and this is on Presto in the query layer, uh, uh, query spin up time, metadata discovery time, all of these things, as performance gets better, um, we're going to uh, expose more and more use cases. Um, today, Presto is excellent for ad hoc queries and, and analytics, uh, building kind of reporting. Um, dashboards are often uh, challenging because performance isn't quite there yet. Uh, but hopefully very, very soon the performance is going to get good enough that uh, dashboarding as well can be served by, uh, by just Presto. Um, and I think that's the point where we're going to see a uh, very massive adoption because that's pretty much the last use case that an analyst or a BI user is going to be running um, uh, on top of their data that today, uh, again, you can do, but it's not necessarily going to be the best, uh, the best fit. Great. Um, oh yeah, uh, I'm, last I'm slide, just on time. Off. I don't have a clock. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cool. Awesome. Um, Thank you so, so yeah. much, Yoni. Uh, great, um, um, a great presentation. There are a couple of questions. So I do want to uh, ask those uh, out so that our uh, attendees get these answered here. First question is, why not just use Presto Kafka besides querying your offline data that need uh, that needs one day to be batched to the warehouse? So you're saying using Presto and querying the data directly off of Kafka? Yeah, so Presto has a Kafka connector uh, and that yeah. where you can stream directly off the uh, of the Kafka stream. So I think that's that's what the question is about. Yeah, so I'd say that there are two main uh, issues with that. The first is that it means that any ad hoc query you run is going to be uh, putting pressure on your Kafka cluster. And Kafka is very powerful as a system, but it's also very sensitive. Uh, often you're going to have it scaled for the ingestion, and you don't really want querying to be ad hoc on, on Kafka. You want to be always reading the tip. Um, definitely you don't want to be reading a day of data out of Kafka. Now, I'm not saying that it's impossible. There's also the challenge that if, for example, you're getting 100,000 events per second, um, getting an amount of data from Kafka equal to a day of data is going to be, it's going to take a very long time. So you're not going to get kind of the query uh, performance that you expect to get that you would get if it was in parquet format. Um, so I'd say like it's a combination of a lot of things, but generally stitching together two solutions, ex especially when one of them is not built to query real time data, um, is you're going to get kind of an iffy, iffy result. All right, and then one last question and we'll uh, wrap up here. Uh, how do you manage the partitioning keys for creating Presto tables when adding new events? You talked a little bit about it, but, uh, and, uh, and how do you evolve the schema if the partitioning key changes? Yeah, so um, Upsolver basically manages a metadata layer itself on S3. Um, and that metadata as new events come in gets updated. So if a new event comes in and that event has a new AWS region, um, we're going to have to add a partition immediately uh, that maps to those new files. So that's basically what Upsolver does. It manages the partitions. And it's a bit more complicated than that. That's really just a high level thing because um, in the end, the partition is dynamic. As you're running compactions, the location of that partition changes over time. So you both need to discover new partitions. Um, you need to delete partitions that were uh, retained out or all the data was deleted from them. Uh, but also just existing partitions need to change their location as as compactions happen and you have kind of better copies of the data that need to be consumed. Uh, and eventually you're going to be deleting the old data as well uh, because you don't want to maintain a lot of copies uh, of partitions. 